The last time we talked about pullbacks. And pullbacks are like tuples. So you provide here a tuple of functions. And it provides a contract for tuples of values for which when you apply the corresponding function to the corresponding value, you get the same thing for all of them. So in this case, when you apply f to x and g to y, they're the same thing. Um, pullbacks are good when you are trying to do um, matching up of source and target when doing symbolic um, composition and various things like that. This time, uh, don't need this one yet. This time we're going to look at what's called the HOM functor. Um, in JavaScript, I can just write a function. Well, I can provide functions to other functions. We've been doing this the whole time, right? So when I say maybe int32, I can pass in int32. If I say, um, you know, prod in int32 stir, um, I'm passing in these things as functions. Uh, they're, they're objects that I can pass around. Now, if we look at um, repeat here, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, repeat. Repeat is a guarded function that goes from int32 to strings. And what HOM does is represent that as a contract. So I say, this contract expects a function from int32s to strings. So let's see how it works. So it's going to be a function. I've given it a name here because I refer to it, um, well, because, well, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, it's a function. I've given it the same name here. It expects a bunch of contracts. The last one is the output contract, and any ones that come before the last one are input contracts. Now, JavaScript accepts arbitrary number of parameters um, as input. So here, this is saying um, the first parameter should be this, should pass this contract, the nth parameter should pass this contract, and the output should pass this contract. So, this line here is kind of complicated looking. The complexity right there, slice is a function, that I haven't defined yet, but I, it's basically just pulling it off of array.prototype and then um, taking this as the thing to bind it to. So it's taking the arguments that are passed in here. Arguments is a special keyword in JavaScript that is an array-like object. It isn't an array, which is kind of annoying. It's this arguments object. Um, but it has numeric indices like an array, and so you can apply the array, the, the built-in slice method on arrays to it because it's generic. It only looks things up by index. It doesn't test uh, the, the internal class property. So what this says is give me the array from 0 to arguments.length minus 1 and pass that into this contract here. That's an array of functions. So test that these things here are all functions. And given that array of functions, make this product contract out of it. 
Okay, next line. Oh, and this arguments.length minus one says all of them except the output. So before is the product, the tuple of input contracts. After is the output contract. So it pulls off the last contract, checks that it's a function. That's output. And then the result is a contract. It expects a function that I'm calling middle. and returns, well, it expects a guarded function, and returns another guarded function. So I say the new guarded function does this stuff. Now this is kind of complicated too, but you see here it does before, and then middle, and then after. So it checks that the arguments provided to this new guarded function, when you convert them to an array, pass this contract on arrays. It says the first parameter should pass input one, so on up to the nth parameter should pass the input n contract. Then it invokes middle. Now because JavaScript um, functions can also be used as methods. What I do here is apply it to whatever object this guarded function gets stored on. So it can be used as a method. Before is of course this contract, but because it's prod n here, it's going to return an array. And apply takes to this parameter and an array. So we've got that matching up nicely. And finally, whatever middle returns, it feeds into the after contract and makes sure that this middle function, this middle guarded function, has the right output type. Then I replace the two string. If I didn't do that, what you would see it when you print out this result is just this text, which is useless when you're debugging. When, when you want to know what function is it that got wrapped this way, um, you really want to see middle. And so what I do is I create a closure that caches middle, sticks it in this stir here, and so then appends to the very end of the of the function um, string, the, the serialized function, it appends this comment that says it has been guarded. So finally I return that result. I put a name on this so that if I print it out, a particular hom, well if I print it out the hom functor, say I'm passing in that to something else. I can just look at the name and figure out what it is. It's not actually necessary. And since I haven't done it on any of the other functors, I'll get rid of it. Here. Um, but this thing, this is, this is actually necessary. So, once again, you supplied a bunch of co input contracts, an output contract. The result is a contract that expects a guarded function and produces a guarded function. Now note that all of our other contracts have returned the input itself that was passed in. Here we are not returning middle. We are returning something that behaves like middle but applies contracts before and after it. And so we rewrite the toString so that um, it tells us this thing is really middle that you're looking at. Um, we could call this a higher order contract because it's not returning middle itself but rather something that, uh, that behaves like middle. 
So now how do we use this? Well, um, we can say hom in 32 string repeat. Let's check up here and find repeat again. There we go. So this version of repeat has, it expects a number in and produces two copies of that number out. So if I have um, 3, 8, and 15 here as numbers in, I can do array of repeat, and that will expect an array of numbers in and give an array of strings out. Great. So now down here at the bottom, I'm wrapping repeat in these, um, in these contracts. Now repeat was already defined to have those contracts. But now I could re-implement re repeat like this. So now when I'm looking at it, I don't have to go searching around through the body of the function I'm implementing to figure out which types have been applied. They're right here on the first line, which, which contracts have been applied. So I've got my input contract and my output contract. It's great. Um, if I wanted to do something that takes no input, well, provide nothing for the input, and provide one contract for the output. So I say var um, one is hom int 32 function return one. So this is a function that takes no inputs and returns one. So there you see no inputs, and then the last parameter is in 32. So given this hom functor here, we can put all of our typing information, all of our contract information at the very beginning so we can see what this the input and output of the function is supposed to be without having to dig through it. Now note that nothing that I did in this definition depended on these things being contracts. I can provide functions, guarded functions, in these positions. What happens when I do that? Well, say I provide a function called before here and the function called after here. Ta-da! I get these two. This becomes um, a function that gets applied before the input, I mean, before this thing here. So anyway, it's before, after, and middle, and so before gets applied first, after gets applied, well, middle gets applied second, after gets applied third. So it strings them all up, and whatever you provide to that contract gets stuck in the middle. Um, this has shades of aspect-oriented programming to it. So when you enter the function, do this. When you exit the function, do that. Um, usually, what we want to do when we enter the function is check the types of the input, and when we exit the function, we check the type of the output but we can do whatever we want at the beginning and end. So HUM is useful in those two ways.